Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Griffin Burns, and I am a research analyst with the Legislative Services Division, and I will be staffing House Energy for the upcoming session. Um, this is part of our Lunch and Learn series that we are offering to legislature, legislators in advance of the upcoming session. So today's topic is energy, but uh, there are some very uh, good topics also being prepared in the coming weeks. And I believe these Lunch and Learn um, series are going to be running through uh, the middle of December. Um, but there might already be some, if you go to the YouTube and type in Montana Legislature, you can see some prior Lunch and Learns um, that kind of keep you up to speed. Um, so let me just share my screen real quick and we'll get started. I mentioned today we're going to be going over energy and we're entitling it Understanding Energy in Montana. Um, but the amount we, the amount of time that we have today, um, we are going to be merely scratching the surface. The energy world and the, the regulations and the dynamics are very complex and very technical in nature. Um, so it can be pretty difficult to navigate. Um, so hopefully by the end of this, you'll at least have a better general understanding of it. Um, and then you can kind of pick up on some of the lingo. And then also we'll briefly cover some uh, potential hot topics that will come up. So um, yeah. Um, one minute. So like I said, we're going to go over some key energy terms and types. Um, we're also going to go over Montana's electricity supply and demand, um, the regulation surrounding energy and utilities, a brief summary of the work that the Energy and Ener Energy Telecommunications Interim Committee did over the 2023-2024 um, interim period that wrapped up in September, and again, some potential hot topics for the upcoming session. Um, most of the material that I will be presenting off today comes from this book that, in partnership with the DEQ and the legislature, um, they publish every few years. Um, I will... This source is available online, but it's also on the legislature's website as well as DEQ's website. Um, and I will be getting more printed copies. Um, so if you are in the building, um, feel free to stop by my office in room 171 and I can get you a copy. Um, there's some really fascinating history on the deregulation and regulation of um, energy in Montana, and then gives you a lot of uh, background on pretty much everything that you would need to know. So it, it's a an invaluable source, I would say. So moving on, um, to understand some of the lingo that is tossed out quite a bit, um, you know, these might be pretty simple, but I still just wanna cover some basic key terms. Generation is one of them. Um, Often you'll hear utilities or people referring to something as a generating asset. So a power plant generates electricity and that, that can come from uh, numerous sources. That could be from traditional fossil fuels like coal, natural gas, um, oil. It can also come from nuclear energy, which uh, currently is not in Montana, but there is a lot of uh, conversation and interest from certain groups to kind of open the door to nuclear energy. And then there's also renewable sources like wind, solar, um, and hydroelectric power. Um, load, you hear people saying utilities are trying to serve load, and that's simply just the amount of electricity um, to operate a device. And I want you to look at transmission and distribution as kind of how you see it in power lines. So you're driving along the highway or the interstate and you see those massive power lines out in the distance that just seem to go for miles. And they do, um, they can travel hundreds of miles. And those are what we call transmission lines. Those are connected directly to the generating asset, and they're traveling, transferring electricity at a very high voltage. Um, and then that power goes to a substation or converter station and it uh, reduces the watts to a more uh, 
consumable level for residential and commercial uses. So that would be what we would call a distribution line. Um, and then simply the grid, that is the, uh, that's what makes it all work. That's where all the, the assets are connected. That's where the transmission lines are connected. Um, it's really a uh, technological marvel um, if you really think about it on a larger scale. Um, and then kilowatts and megawatts. Um, kilowatts is simply a thousand watts and megawatts is a million watts. But um, in terms of the conversation, for example, kilowatts, like utilities will, they say a, an average household um, consumes 750 kilowatts per hour. Um, so they do a lot of their modeling um, kind of on that 750 kilowatt scale. And then megawatts, you will hear like a power plant or coal strip um, has a generating megawatt, megawatt output of, for example, 1500 megawatts. So yeah, just some key terms. I'm, you might already know them, but I just wanted to quickly go over those. Um, so moving on, some quick facts for you. Montana has the nation's largest recoverable coal reserves, which is about 30% of uh, the total in the United States and accounts for about 5% of the coal production. Um, no surprise here, but Montana's temperature extremes and small population contribute to the state's residential sector having the highest per capita energy consumption by any state. Um, and 2023, Montana ranked among the top 10 states with the largest share of electricity generated from renewables, about 50%. And uh, coal fire power plants provided the largest share of Montana's electricity generation in 2023. Um, but I will say in recent years, that number kind of fluctuates between hydroelectric power and coal fire, at, uh, coal power. It really depending on uh, the time of year and kind of the, the flow of water and the precipitation that we have um, and depending on the temperatures that we're experiencing. Moving on, here's some other kind of a breakout of more recent data. This is from July, 2024. Um, you can see coal is still at the highest, um, but please note this uh, Energy Information Administration. Um, this is a very good site. They have tables like this and can break out a lot of information and it's all available. And um, I highly recommend um, giving it a look. So um, just to give you an idea of where generating assets are kind of peppered throughout the state, um, this map was provided by DEQ. Um, as you can kind of see, there's a little bit of mix of everything. Uh, Northwestern Montana, a lot of hydropower. Um, and then you can see towards the Southeast in gray, that is coal strip as uh, where the coal power is at. And then you can kind of see wind and solar peppered throughout the state. And towards Eastern Montana, there is natural gas. Um, a lot of that gas is uh, Tra travels via pipeline from Canada and uh, North Dakota and then comes into Montana. So just to give you an idea, um, give you an idea what the kind of which power it's, or which uh, generating asset produces the most. Um, coal strip is at number one with about 1500 megawatts. And that is after um, units one and two of coal strip are retired in 2020 but it still is at the highest output. Um, and then we'll go into a little bit more detail on coal strip here shortly, but uh, it's still operate. It, it's not necessarily saying that uh, coal strip is running always around 1480 megawatts. It just has that capability. And then you can see some of the other ones are hydro dams in the Northwest and then some pretty big wind farms and some, yeah. And this kind of gives you an idea of those transmission lines that I was referring to um, and the utilities that own them. Um, as you can see, there's some, it's kind of all over the place, um, but transmission in Montana is another kind of topic that we will cover and we will kind of continue to cover, but Montana is pretty isolated and uh, it's in the grid, I guess I you should say. Um, Montana contractually exports 
more power than it imports. And when those extreme temperatures that we have, it can cause issues for utilities trying to sustain load. But we will cover transmission a little more here shortly. Um, this map is kind of kind of difficult to break out, but this is the utility service map. Uh, most of the state is uh, is served by Northwestern Energy and electric cooperatives. As you can see up here, there is uh, tribal utilities. Uh, tribes do have the authority to generate their own power. Um, but yeah, all this green, it's kind of a wonky map, but uh, that is all Northwestern Energy companies. And rural, uh, electric cooperatives are typically serve in more rural areas originally. Um, so on. And this is kind of to give you an idea of, um, oh, excuse me, skip the slide. So there's three different types of utility models. Um, there's an investor owned utilities. Um, these are private for profit, for profit companies. Um, so an example of an investor owned utility would be uh, Northwestern Energy. Um, there's also public power and municipal utilities. Um, most of the nation is served by investor-owned utilities or cooperatives. Um, Montana deregulated in the late 90s and most other states kind of deregulated by the uh, early 2000s. Um, but um, there are still public power, still states that have public power or cities that have public power. For example, Nebraska is still served by public power and um, investor owned utilities do not exist in Nebraska. Um, and kind of the differences. Um, so investor owned utilities are regulated by the Public Service Commission. Um, again, mostly in urban areas, they are a for-profit business. There's two in the state. Montana, Dakota Utilities mostly serves um, distinct parts in Eastern Montana. And then the cooperatives are not subject to the PSC's regulation and they're nonprofit member owned. And there's about 25 operating currently in the state. So regulation, the Public Service Commission, um, Public Service Commission um, typically is an under the radar agency um, up until recently, I, I should say. It, uh, PSC has more functions that I think people are aware about or people are kind of unsure what the Public Service Commission actually does. Um, Public Service Commission started as the Board of Railroad Commissioners in the early 1900s. Um, it was three commissioners elected to six years staggered terms, but you know, obviously as uh, power became uh, more abundant with the uh, in the coming years, it was transferred into the Public Service Commission to um, regulate utilities. So in 1974, the PSC was uh, changed to the makeup that we see today. Um, these are commissioners are elected into four year terms, four year staggered terms. And among the commissioners themselves, they, uh, they appoint a president and vice president. I've been told that uh, Commissioner Fielder will be uh, taking over the president as the, serving as the president of the Public Service Commission going forward. Um, so aside from regulating utility companies, um, well, not just energy companies, they also do um, telephone companies, sewer companies, water companies, um, and transportation like garbage hauling is an example of something else that they do. Um, but the most important thing that the Public Service Commission does that uh, affects most of Montanans is uh, they are responsible for setting the rates. So the PSC's job is to ensure reasonable rates for customers, but also for the utilities um, to still be profitable. Um, in addition to setting the rates, um, they also oversee a utility's long uh, long-term supply resource planning. Um, these plans are submitted every two years um, and it kind of gives how these plans are designed to how is the utility going to meet the demands for their customers. 
And then additionally, the PSC, another very important function is they, um, if Northwestern Energy wants to go, uh, let's say, for example, buy a new wind farm in eastern Montana from an energy developer, um, typically the utility will want to and recoup um, that purchase through uh, charging customers. So the PSC is subject to approving um, that acquisition if they intend um, to use it, establish it in the rate base. Moving on, the uh, uh, the Energy and Tele Telecommunications Interim Committee wrapped up in September, um, and we did have a study bill, one of the few interim committees that did have a study bill, um, and that was the study of electric power reserves, but particularly, it was kind of, it was at the request of the utilities, and it was in direct response of cold snaps, um, some of the uh, polar vortexes Montana has been experiencing in the wintertime. So when it gets negative 30 and 40, um, utilities are really struggling to uh, sustain load. I mean, even to the point where uh, rolling blackouts could occur. And uh, if you remember in 2021, um, the fiasco in Texas, I mean, there was... Uh, millions without power and uh that same storm in 2021 montana was uh also affected and parts of eastern montana were almost uh shut down um the study was kind of looking at the factors that led to that and any possible solutions but you'll come to find in the energy world a lot of these um, problems are on a regional and national level. So it's kind of difficult for the state um, to sometimes do something about it. Um, so the study didn't amount to a bill draft or an official recommendation, but it'll be a continue continuing uh, interest. Um, for example, during that time, this past year in January, uh, Northwestern, so when it gets that extremely cold, Northwestern is going to the wholesale electricity market to uh, get power to prevent these blackouts and uh, delays in power delivery. Um, in January, it was the highest sustained load that Northwestern Energy has ever experienced. Um, and uh, Northwestern, the prices that they paid for megawatt hour were about six hundred to a thousand dollars higher, or about eight to fourteen times higher than any other uh, within a typical January. Um, the committee also kind of broadly, I'm calling it energy regionalization. It was kind of uh, encompassed a lot of things. Uh, the committee it was educationally based, and the committee was informed of new electricity markets out there, um, new technology that exists. For example, um, some new renewable energy uh, battery storage solutions um, and kind of looking at the transmission system itself and what can Montana do to alleviate some of the transmission constraints and uh, the generating generation constraints that the state uh, currently um, is experiencing. Um, and then from the 2023 session, it did create a special select committee on energy resource planning and acquisition. It was otherwise known as SCRPA. Um, and that did produce a uh, bill draft that is currently out there. I did put that LC number in for you. It should be available on Bill Explorer. Um, and this committee was established basically in direct response of the, the Laurel gas plant that uh, recently was opened. Um, it was the permit that was given for this plant um, was uh, litigated on um, basically that the utilities and the department needs to um, not show bias and uh, have more public engagement when they are acquiring assets like this Lowell gas plant. 
So that what this bill is doing is uh, creating an independent evaluator um, to kind of mediate between the utility, uh, the Department of Environmental Quality, and as well as uh, the Consumer Council. Um, so moving on, and this is what, so the, these are some session conversations. Um, you know, this is stuff that has been communicated to me, um, but you know, this is speculation. So it, it's, I've, uh, it's hard to say if this will be as a uh, hot topic as it was during the interim period, but wildfire liability was a huge one. Um, that's a pretty scary photo right there that you can see, but big utilities are across the nation are paying billions of dollars in tort claims um, and being found liable for these wildfires. Um, if you remember the Hawaii fire that happened a couple of years ago, the unprecedented fire, um, Hawaii Electric is, uh, as far as I know, um, ordered to pay $2 billion in tort claims. So utilities are very worried about it. They, uh, you know, if they have a situation, if Northwestern Energy has a situation like Hawaii Electric, they might not survive. Um, so they want some sort of regulation in the state to uh, protect them. Uh, and wildfire liability, there's not a lot of uh, statute out there. Um, it's pretty broad standard of care um, that could be applied to it, but Northwestern Energy has uh, communicated to me in the interim that is one of their top priorities. So another hot topic for the upcoming session, you recognize this here, that is Coal Strip, Montana. Um, you know, the ending of coal strip and coal fire generation nationwide is um, coming to an end, but how soon? That is kind of the question. Um, by January 2020, or sorry, by January 1st, 2026, uh, Northwestern Energy will be the majority shareholder in coal strip. It's currently served by six owners um, by various utilities, but a few of those utilities are based out of Washington. Washington has uh, regulations now that will go in effect that Washington cannot uh, consume power that was generated from coal. So um, those utilities are backing out and Northwestern was uh, eager and did uh, claim those stakes in the plant. But also there are recent federal EPA uh, what we're calling mercury air and toxic standards that were uh, finalized in March or excuse me, May. And the, these uh, federal uh, rules are particularly targeting coal strip. Um, and this was from the Biden-Harris administration. Um, so it's hard to say what could happen with the new administration coming in. Maybe these rules are reserved uh, reverse, but you know that could be lengthy. Um, but I've been told um, it's basically carbon capture um, requirements that the uh, the plant or coal strip that will have to do. Um, they have to uh, capture at least ninety percent of their emissions, and coal strip is floating around like I've heard eighty seven, eighty eight percent. So um, even that two percent that uh, I've been told is a minimum from the utilities, a $350 million investment. So the question is, will, will they wanna pay that when it's uh, already kind of has a sunset date? So Coal Strip uh, has, always has been and will continue to be. So it, it's kind of hard to say right now what's gonna happen to it, but uh, I'm sure we will hear more about it. And then the next one, I kind of talked about the transmission constraints. Um, Montana is contractually, um, some of the power that is generated in coal strip, it's guaranteed to the Western states. Um, but now with the regulations in Washington at least and Oregon, those contracts might go away. But as you can see this map here, for example, we are exporting 200 and 2,200 megawatts only coming back 1350. And Montana is currently not connected to the Eastern grid and we don't get a lot of power from the South. Um, but 
there is a potential light at the end of the tunnel, and that is the new Northwest, or excuse me, North Plains Connector Project. Um, this is a pretty exciting prospect for a lot of people in the energy world, but basically this would connect uh, the Eastern grid and the Western grid, uh, specifically uh, in Montana at Coal Strip. Um, so this is pretty far away um, in terms of when it could possibly happen, but uh, it's in a scoping process right now. Then if regulatory approval goes well, I've been told construction will start somewhere around the 2028 time frame. And then uh, the completion where it would be operational uh, would be in the early 2030s. It's currently owned and the project manager is a company called Grid United. Um, so after it's completed and constructed, um, I would, I've been told that Grid United will probably is open to utility ownership. So that could come from uh, North Dakota based utility, Montana based utility. So uh, who will own that line in the future um, could change. Um, so it's, but it's exciting thing that I, I feel like uh, people will be citing a lot and when we were uh, hearing these energy bills. Um, so another controversial topic is the public service commission itself. Um, there's currently from the 2023 session, uh, there was Senate bill 109 and that remapped the public service commission. Um, the legislature was ordered to, uh, draw a new map of the following the 2020 redistricting. Um, and this is what, uh, Senate bill 109 did. And there is a challenge right now that is saying that it's uh, gerrymandered. Um, the argument, if you look at kind of these districts right here, it's cutting through major cities. What typically used to be, you know, groups of counties is now cutting these cities in half. Um, so that trial is set for December 10th. Um, so it really depends if, uh, if the ruling is uh, uh, granted to the, the plaintiffs. Um, if that was the case, then the legislature would be uh, forced to provide a new, write a new map. And so we'll really have to kind of keep our, our eye out this one. And also this is, this particular case is kind of what birthed the uh, legislative privilege, um, recent changes and challenges that are going on. So public service commission, I feel like will be a pretty uh, hot topic. And even the commission makeup itself, there has been a lot of uh, attempts over the years to change, condense the amount of districts and also um, add qualifications to be a public service commissioner. Um, so we'll have to wait and see if uh, that will happen. So um, something to be on the lookout for. And that is all I have for you today. Again, my name is Griffin Burns. I'm, I will be staffing House Energy. And then my counterpart on the Senate side will be Jason Moore. Um, we are located in room 171. Um, but again, this is very low level stuff, but I hope you learned something and uh, I appreciate the time. But now, um, as far as I understand it, they're gonna stop the recording and if there's any questions we can, or discussions uh, we can, uh, if I don't know the answer for you today, I can definitely get that answer to you ASAP. So with that being said, are there uh, anything, any questions or any clarification that someone needs?